So uh, thank you for the introduction. This is absolutely amazing. I'm just so proud to be standing in front of all of you today. Uh, I'm always amazed when people show up to hear me speak about uh, anything at all, <laughs> but in particular about the park system. It is a jewel of a park system, and, and Tom said so well when Cleveland was talking about you know, building this wonderful place to think about what it is today and how it transforms the city of Minneapolis and what it is and the health and wellness and the vibrancy and why people want to be here is because I truly believe is the park system and what it means to people. Um, I've been doing this now here in this role since 2019. Um, I had 19 years prior to coming back to uh, Minnesota and having this privilege of being in this particular role uh, for the last five years. Uh, if anybody, when I arrived here, uh, the first thing I, I hit in 2019 was the uh, polar, polar vortex and coming from North Carolina, I was kind of like, you know, five years, I was really enjoying it, then came back and all of a sudden I was like, well, welcome back, Al. And then, uh, and then uh, you know, everything happened at that time too, of course, in the last several years has been really challenging. But uh, I love this work and it's just a real honor uh, to be actually standing here and invited to speak to you today. So um, I think what I'm gonna try to do today here is I'm gonna go through these slides, uh, try to be as visual as possible and as quick as possible, because uh, talking too long can be a challenge. Uh, but I wanna share with you really the vibrancy and the complexity of this organization. Uh, we can talk about numbers, you know, $156 million uh, organization, but when a fun fact, uh, there's the we're the fifth largest bureaucracy in the state. So you have Minneapolis, St. Paul, Duluth, Rochester, Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. So you should be proud of that. That's how significant we are. Um, and so we should advocate for such a jewel of a park system and the uniqueness of what it is. It's an independent, semi-autonomous board owned by the people. And I am a servant to the public for you all, for the people. So with that, let's get started and let's kind of start to work through this again. Um, I'm gonna start with again, what is the park board? Tom kind of said it before so well. We're a semi-autonomous uh, agency. We have an elected board, six district commissioners and three at large, who some of are here today, so they're making me nervous. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but they're amazing, we have a great board, we have a great board, and very, very proud of them, and we are accomplishing a lot. We are focused on this park system, the 140 years since 1883 of what this park system is and what a jewel it is to our city. It's a massive organization with massive responsibilities and, and really big impact to the community. And so I'm gonna talk about that a little bit, a, a little bit today. So uh, let's, let's see if we can kind of go through this a little bit. I love these photos. So enjoy the pictures if you can, because it kind of reflects who we are. So what does the park board do? We care for our natural resources. It's very important. Um, and what you see, there's a tree canopy across Minneapolis and we care for our natural resources across our city. One of the most significant is our trees. 600,000 600, trees we care for. 400,000 of those are in our parks and 200,000 are on what we call public streets. We are responsible for the tree canopy in our city. We plant about 10,000 trees every single year. And um, if you ever have a chance, and I'm just gonna throw a shout out here, Assistant Superintendent Barrick is over here, who's my tree guy, I love when he talks about trees, it's really cool. I never thought I would say that, but it's really cool. But if you go down the West Parkway and you look at Bohemian Flats, you will see the trees that are being planted out every single year. I, I guarantee you, if you go down there and see it, it's a wonderful sight to see all the variety of trees lined up that are gonna be put into the ground around our city to talk about our, our tree canopy and our cooling of our city and the importance of what these, these trees are. So if you have a chance, Bohemian Flats, go see it in the spring, it's amazing. And in fact, even if you want to take a little tour, let us know, we'll get you in there. So we also care for our natural resources, of course, our water bodies, right? Our water quality of our city. We have dedicated staff that are literally water quality experts. They are amazing, the knowledge they have, the background and professionalism of these folks is incredible. They track the water quality of our lakes and our beaches, as we know, we want to swim in healthy lakes. We want our, we want our kids to play in it, we want to fish in it, and we want to enjoy it. The park board is responsible for all the lakes in our system. And also, of course, all of our creeks. We implement projects to improve water quality constantly. And we have inspectors, if you've seen them, at all of our boat launches that prevent zebra mussels from coming into our water bodies and our lakes. I always stop by when I see them, I say hi to them and I talk to them. It's really kind of cool, the stuff that they will tell you, how they inspect our boats. But it's such a small thing when you think about it, but it's so important for the health of our ecosystem, the health of our lakes. These folks do the work every day out there and we're so proud of them. But these professionals keep our lakes healthy. And uh, again, I can go into so much more than that, but they're amazing folks. We also do invasive management. 
And in this picture, you'll see, of course, buckthorn, right? Everybody talks about buckthorn, right? Staff who plan in the management of our natural resources that work every day to provide uh, the expertise around our natural resources. I can't begin to tell you the amount of things that they have to recognize across our park system. It's just, it's really stunning. Um, and I'll give an example, like the management plan for, our, for Eloise Butler is a 104-page document. If you want to sleep at night, read that one. But it's, it's pretty incredible to see the amount of work that we do at Eloise Butler. It's really, it's really cool to see the work. Um, but they also coordinate in volunteer, uh, volunteer groups. And a big part of this is our volunteers. And I'm going to give a shout out to Jim Proctor uh, with the friends of the Eloise Butler and Susan Wilkins, who's the garden curator. I did a tour with them out there at Eloise Butler. I walked it. They educated me. They taught me. And they shared with me really the responsibility and what they, the amazing work they do at that beautiful sanctuary of a place. And I actually cut the top of the buckthorn. It's shallow roots, so it's all up in the stem, and then you dig it out, really cool. So uh, it's really exciting stuff. So they're wonderful people and do wonderful work every day. Uh, let's see here. All right, we have 12, former 12 formal gardens. We care for, again, our gardens. How many of you have visited the 12 formal gardens in our city? Raise your hand. 12 of them, right? There's 12. They're amazing. Um, if you have a chance to go there and enjoy and appreciate the beauty that's cultivated by our professionals, they're, they're just amazing. You should see the number of bulbs they plant before the next year, thousands of bulbs, right? And how they line them up perfectly, and they, they're, so, they're so passionate. I have the privilege of walking down to the trial gardens and the rose gardens and the Longfellow gardens and the Loring Park gardens, and we can go on and on. They're amazing places that are curated. But I also want to make sure you know that we're really trying hard to do more so around our park system, not only in our entries into regional parks, but around our park buildings and in front of our signs. They're doing amazing work, and they're fantastic professionals. But again, the complexity of the organization is one of, one of many things. We also have 15 community gardens, which cultivate, you can go in and cultivate your own produce. And MPRB established these gardens for our community. We work together um, with our, our community gardeners. And it's managed by the community, the community members. And it's coordinated by the MPRB staff. So 15 community gardens. We have seven new ones that are coming on. And just imagine, and I'll give you an example. There's Bryden Vale Gar Bridal Vale Garden, which was formerly the Towerside Park, Cipro Site, Dickman, Lindell Farmstead, brand new. Loring uh, has one, of course. We have um, Potterhorn Park, PV just has one. So they're all over the place. But these are people that are now digging their hands in the gardens. They're growing produce with their children and their families. And it's really an amazing, amazing thing. We also have owned land that we don't garden, but we have the Sioux Line, the Shalom Garden, the Bancroft Meridian Garden, and of course, Shingle Creek Commons. But again, these are things that we're really excited about. And we see community out there every day in the gardens and building community and, and actually eating healthy food. So it's pretty exciting. And of course, our beloved trails, right? Such a unique thing that we have that we can ride our bikes along the lakes and the rivers. It's, it's really incredibly unique. So we have 51 miles of walking trails and 51 miles of biking trails for 102 miles of trails through our parks. And of course, you know, these were called the National Scenic Byway by the Federal Highway Administration in April of 1998, and the Federal Highway Administration as the premier national urban scenic byway also in 1998. What a privilege to have these spaces where we can recreate and ride and walk and enjoy an incredible park system. And if we talk about real equity, about people being able to go across the city freely and at peace, they can go across to every neighborhood through our park system. And that's just absolutely amazing. Um, and we also have 55 miles, of course, parkways. And so they're not through fairs, but they're byways. They're, they're, they're park land, but they're, the, they're how people move around the city and travel along it in such a peaceful way. It's so unique and it's contiguous, right? Not a lot of stop signs. It's just a wonderful experience. We also do 143.1 miles of trails cleared year round that we do. Let's talk about more of our amenities. 49 recreation centers, really unique. If you go around the country, it's a very unique thing. 47 are operated by the MPRB and two are operated by nonprofit groups. We have 65, uh, 65 aquatic facilities. And you ask, it's not natatoriums, I'll tell you what it is. We have one natural pool, Weber, which is one of the first in the country. Um, and we can talk about that place, it's amazing. Two indoor swimming pools at Phillips Community Center, public pools for our residents. Two water parks at Jim Lupient and of course in, in North Commons 
and 59 wading pools. And that's the real jewel of our park system. It's such an easy thing to recreate. It's, if you want to program it, you, you kind of do a fun program, and they go out there and swim. You go, that's a program. That's pretty cool, you know? Um, it's really amazing. But talk about when people need to cool off and go to spaces. That's where they go. They go to the wading pools, and they are absolutely beloved. Uh, and and we, we love them. We had to force TPL to count them, by the way. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. That's all I get that. So uh, we also have courts, right? We have infrastructure courts. Um, the ones you see here, which is really exciting, is the Nokomis courts with two others at Loring and Dickman that are coming. And we also have uh, 105 tennis courts, 12 pickleball only courts, and 75 basketball courts. Pickleball has exploded. We are paying attention and we are creating these courts. There is a war going on between tennis and pickleball, but we'll talk about that later on. I'm a tennis player, so I get it. Morgan courts are safe at this point, so we'll leave those alone. But we resurfaced 31 courts this year and we continue to resurface courts. So you'll see that happening all across our system. 118 playgrounds across our parks. I mean, of course, the playgrounds are like the foundation of our, of our park system, right? And they're just, we're just, we're doing remodel, we, we, we are building new ones. I've dedicated so many of them this year and cut the ribbon on these, it's really been amazing. Uh, we also have a really cool one at Key Waden. If you've been there, we have a first bouldering playground, so we're meeting people where they are at. I was too scared to climb it, but these kids ramped up on there. Commissioner Musich actually climbed it. I have a picture of that. It's just pretty cool. But uh, we're meeting the needs of our community, and our playgrounds are really essential to that. So 118 playgrounds we're responsible for. And let's talk about, of course, our golf courses, which I think are some of the best public golf courses in the country, I believe. We have three golf driving ranges. Uh, of course, you know all of our courses. I can name them. Columbia, Theodore Snelling, uh, Meadowbrook. What you see here is Meadowbrook Clubhouse, which we just built. It used to be like a kind of a, what do you call it, a pull behind or, you know, a, like one of those temporary homes. Then we built this wonderful structure. But we have wonderful golf courses across our park system. And we're very proud of that. We have an amazing crew that does great work. And that, of course, is Meadowbrook. So go out there and enjoy that. It's a wonderful place to be at. And so again, uh, oh, we of course have three disc golf courses too. So uh, very proud of our golf courses. And of course, we have our ice arenas. Um, we have two that are Parade and at Northeast. Parade Arts Garden, I mean, it's, that place is just unbelievable. Every time I drive by there, the, the, it's packed. There's like literally the, the whole parking lot is full and young people and families are out there enjoying that. They have pro ice skating, figure skating, which is really great. Um, I want to drive a Zamboni someday. I'm going to learn how to do that. Um, it's a good paying job, I hear. Um, so it's what they call it, side hustle. Uh, I might do that. But it's a wonderful, wonderful place. Um, and again, uh, great places. Northeast needs some work. There's no question. Northeast is kind of like band-aiding it together. But what a jewel that we have. And so uh, we're going to be working on that place too. Uh, the Wild dedicated one of the workout rooms up there. So we're really grateful for the Wild uh, for that space. And simply basic infrastructure. I couldn't possibly name all the benches and water fountains and picnic tables and kiosks and signs and all the things that we're responsible for across our park system. Uh, they're tremendous. Um, the one thing I want to give an example when we talk about caring for these amenities, I want to talk about real fast about innovative example. Um, we have eight new murals that we place around our, our parks. I don't know if you've seen them. They're just beautiful. And we talk about graffiti that impacts like our parks we got to care for our spaces. And we see these wonderful artists that come forward, and we've done these beautiful murals around Harriet, Bede Makaska, right? Uh, Boom Island just had one that's put up there. Um, we had, what else? Geez, we have one around uh, Northeast. Wyndham, yeah, they're beautiful. And if you have a chance to see them, go on our website, but I actually encourage you to go take a look at them. These are artists that have put these really wonderful murals across our park system. And that's how we take care of our park system, right? We remove, the, we remove the graffiti, we work with trades department, our planning department, and we came up with this idea to impact our system. So again, very proud of that. And let's talk about some of the hosting and activities that we do every single day around our, our, our parks. We have sports leagues, 14 different sports leagues. Right now, for the adult in the fall, they did fall, they did basketball, bocce ball, cornhole. I love cornhole, it's a sport, I love it. Cornhole. <laughs> <laughs> I struggled with that one for a little bit, but uh, f flag football, USA, uh, volleyball. Uh, for youth, we have every, every imaginable sport you can think of uh, that they're doing right now. And they have, what we're doing now is eSports, right? It is a true sport. They actually have uniforms, they train. Um, they have actually, they do uh, scholarships 
now for that. You can get a $25,000 to go to college. They have actual teams. It's a billion dollar industry. A 17 year old, I believe, also won this competition in a stadium with 60,000 people. I think he walked away with $1.7 million. And then a light bulb went on. He was like, this is a pretty good living, right? <laughs> Esports. Um, so it's just a wonderful thing that we do. And we have a tremendous amount of sports that we do every day and leagues that we offer throughout um, our, our organization. Dodgeball, if you want to watch adult dodgeball and see the destruction of human beings, go to that one. It's really interesting. <laughs> it's amazing. It's fun. I won't do it, but it's fun. All right. So art classes. We have, I think, some of the best art classes. This is Powderhorn uh, Ceramic Studio, which I had the privilege of actually building out when I was there at Powderhorn for six years. Um, it was a dark space, and we said, let's build this out. I think it's one of the best party studios in the city, um, and they have some wonderful programs there. We have Art in the Park, wonderful partners with Mia. We have free summer workshops in Minneapolis uh, parks. We have ballet classes, jazz classes. We have tap, simple thing of bracelet making, right? Just so many programs that I can't go through all here at this moment. And at this very moment at North Commons Park, they're actually eating their art. They're building gingerbread houses, right, <laughs> tonight. So it's just a variety of things that we talk about that we do in our park system. They're simple, but they're amazing. They connect people, and uh, we couldn't be more proud and I'm just giving you just a taste of some of the things that we do. And we also do environmental education programs. I love this photo here of these two dads with their kids, or they could be uncles, whoever it might be, walking at the uh, North Mississippi area, dragonfly catching, right? They're monitoring dragonflies, and they're talking about dragonflies and about the ecosystem, the biodiversity of our, of our city, and they go on hikes with naturalists, and they learn how to support dragonflies, right? Really cool, and that's just one example. And I remember hearing these kids talking one time. They said, uh, parents were talking to kids. They said, you know, we used to drive on trips on our cars, and our windshields would be so splattered, you have to pull over and clean the windshield. I remember this as a kid. And then now when you drive cross country, you don't have that much, right? You notice that? There's not as many insects that splatter your windshield. That's a real sign of things that are real, right? Our biodiversity, our insects, and what we're doing to our environment. And it's something that just struck me when I heard this parent talking about it. I was like, God, he's got a point. It's, it's very different. So, this is the thing that we do as a park system and we teach our young people with our family members and our environmental staff do a great job of that. I love this photo too, hosting events. See the seriousness of her <laughs> with, that, uh, with those things. It's called, uh, this is called the Senior Nordic Walking at Northeast Center. What I love about this picture is that when we talk about older adults, I won't say seniors, because I got my ARPA card, was it ARPA, uh, I got, was that 50, right? Is that, is that, what is it called again? Oh, that's right, I won't name it. <laughs> no, but that's it, yeah, I got it. But you know, the older adults, we're older adults, and we talk about intergenerational programs. We're talking about adults that are active. I'm 57, and uh, I'm still refusing to play pickleball, but I love it, I'm still playing tennis. Um, you know, but uh, you know, I, it, it's, it's a fun sport, pickleball is great, and, but I do a variety of other things too, right? So we have to make really an understanding of uh, older adults, in particular in the state of Minnesota. Really fun fact. 65 plus in Minnesota will double between the, ages, uh, between the years 2010 and 2030. And by 2035, right, 12 years from now, they will exceed the population of our 1800 age group for the first time in Minnesota history. This is incredibly important, right, that we pay attention to the needs of our community and that we, we make sure that we meet these needs. And here's a picture of our older adults playing outside, not in a building, thinking about, you know, are they playing bingo? No, they're out there and they're active and they're going around doing some wonderful things as we all do. Oh, we offer childcare. We have an amazing, amazing childcare program. Uh, we have 13 sites across our parks. And, and I'll be short on this one. Can you imagine like being in a park? And if you see this picture here, people, what better place to have a daycare than in our parks? I mean, imagine the amount of things you can do from science and technology and engineering and math and, and arts and crafts and walking trips and, and themed activities and sports and physical activity in our park system. I think it's one of the best values in, in, in the city, you know, hands down. And they have wonderful uh, people that work with our young, our young people every day. And it's ages five to 12, and uh, it is a wonderful program, and it's something we do every day for our young people. And uh, I can't say enough about our staff that do the wonderful work around that, uh, but I wanted to share that with you also. 13 sites, amazing daycare program. We do a lot of festivals. Festivals after festivals and events after events. Right now, I think we're gonna be having the winter solstice that's gonna be happening now at the Kronig Nature Center. Please go to it. There's gonna be the Nicollet Island Winter Market. 50 different vendors this weekend, 
Um, Jennifer, I'm giving a shout out to the team. <laughs> but it's gonna be this weekend, Saturday. Yes, thank you, she corrected me. Uh, Saturday, uh, it's gonna be amazing. Please go out there and visit it at Nicollet Island. We have music and movie series. Uh, we have seven sites, 223 scheduled shows, 128,000 attendees that, were, that attended those series. The movie series, 98 dates with 13,000 attendees, right? This is what we do all summer. If you go around to the Harriet Band Show or anywhere, uh, we have buskers too, by the way. We have a busker program, which is really great. They're doing well, um, but they're playing. But we do so many events, so many festivals. This is Juneteenth, which is a wonderful uh, event that we do. And we have also um, markets that we're doing. We have these small business markets and entrepreneurs that bring really uh, fresh food, homemade goods, opportunities for small businesses and entrepreneurs. Four markets that we had this year at Commons, Waterworks, Minnehaha Falls, and Lake Harriet. Four sites and 49 dates. I hope you had a chance to go see those. If you haven't, we'll do it again next year. Another thing the Park Board does. And of course, camps. We have tons of camps. They're absolutely amazing. Um, I can't, they sell, I mean, they just fill up and there's so many camps that we do. I can't begin to tell you all of them, but we do have youth sports camps, day camps, specialty camps, tons of specialty camps, safety camps, nature camps, and we even have a giving example of a niche camp, drone camp. It was the coolest thing that you could see as kids find drones. It was just stunning. And in fact, we're using it as our marketing now where you kind of fly into a building, you know, and, and then you kind of say, if you want to rent this building, it's so cool. It's, anyways, it's really neat. Um, but we do some really great camps and we have farm to table camps also, which we'll talk about. Um, and these young people, uh, I'm thinking this is Lake of the Isles, right? Because that's where all that, uh, you can see those pads, lily pads out there, so I'm pretty sure that's it. But what a wonderful, wonderful thing that we do again for our young people. Camps are amazing. All right, safety and permitting. Let's talk about our safety and permitting a little bit. Um, this was a privilege to sit in this picture. It's one of those things, one of my uh, bucket list ones, uh, when we sat all together out at Ole Olson. But, you know, I'll be really brief about our, our police officers. Um, they're amazing folks. Uh, you know, they're, they're led by the mission and vision of this park system. The chief of police reports into me, uh, but they're responsible for all the residents of Minneapolis. 85% of the work or more is for our parks. They keep them safe. And the beauty of them is that they uh, really build community. They know our kids. They know who we are. They can tell you the name of their children, where parents live. It's an amazing connection. And when they respond, they respond because they know who we are. And they meet us at the door. They say, hey, what's going on, Al? And he's kind of acting up a little bit over there. We go, we sit down, we talk, and that's it, right? They're, they do some great work. Um, and one of the examples I would give to you, and Commissioner Schaefer, who's here, uh, really worked very hard with our, our police around Stevens, around Loring. Uh, we did some amazing work and that really transformed the parks. It went from sometimes the, you wouldn't know Loring Park is one of the highest crime areas, went down to almost zero because of the work of our officers, the work I'll talk about, our community connections team, but working with our community and our dedicated staff, just amazing, but they do great work. CCVP, Community Connections and Violence Prevention Team, it's something that I worked with our team and we formulated this new, this new division, new department. And they're really based about safety and they do a proactive, collaborative, relationship-based relationship approach, successfully leveraging the community connections that they have in the community to really change lives, to be the first people that walk into a situation, whether it's trauma or someone's having a really bad day. It's not our officers first approaching, it's these wonderful people who show up and they talk to our our residents and people that are out every day in our park. It's not just de-escalation, it's about seeing a face, knowing who they are, and they connect community. They have a youth advisory council between the ages of 14 to 17 years old. They have a pop-up parks that they go to parks that are not being you know, heavily used, and they activate that particular park with games and music and activities. And they also have a youth mentorship program between the ages of 10 to 13 years old, and they do culturally focused initiatives. This is their work. They train, they learn, and they go out there every day to make a connection in the community. And they're a wonderful group of people, and they're brilliant. Um, master's degrees and backgrounds, and they're wonderful people, and they're really connected to the community. So we're very proud of them. Let's talk about our employees a little bit here. Uh, this group, I love this group. They're the ones when I talked about all the events are happening in our park system, <laughs> that's the group. Uh, you'll see them everywhere with music series and Awamini Festival, and. They're just amazing. Um, they're wonderful, wonderful people and they do great work uh, and I can't be more proud of them. We have 631 full-time employees. We have over 1,500 part-time provisional staff. 
that work for this organization. It's well over 2,000 people that we're responsible for, and we're incredibly proud of them. Recreation. Uh, this picture is just of a, uh, a young lady who is working with one of our young people in our parks. They're everywhere, they work every day, they're committed, they're passionate, they work hard for our park system, they love what they do, and we could not do what we do without these really brilliant, wonderful, compassionate, empathetic staff who really have brilliant ideas that they always want to try. And the beauty of recreation, if it fails, you just kind of go, oh, it's no problem, what's the next thing, right? It's not, you're not measured on it in a sense, you just kind of readapt, right? And these folks do wonderful work every day in our park system, and we are so grateful for them. Our trades department, everything you see that's going on here, every repair um, of our equipment, our engines, our buildings, uh, woodworks, tra our trades, wonderful group of folks, incredibly talented, that take care of our park system every single day. And they work hard and they're out there every day doing the work and uh, keeping our place either band-aided sometimes or really exceptionally beautiful, but um, they do great work and we're very proud of them. Our environmental team. This is the Quaking Bog Guided Tour in 2022. Um, and she's smiling because, <laughs> kid you not, they, they smile all the time. They love their work. I mean, when I go talk to them, I went down to Eloise Butler. I think I was probably there an hour longer than I thought I would be uh, because, you know, there's like, I got to tell you about this, Al, you know, and we started talking. And they're like, just come walk with me. And I started walking, right? And it was a beautiful experience because I didn't know half of the stuff that she was saying. And it was just amazing. It's a magical place. So I'm really grateful for them. And they're very passionate, brilliant, educated people who love this work and are, again, amazing. Um, we just couldn't be anything without them. So great, great group of folks. This one is J.D. Rivers. We have a wonderful staff that manage this magical place in Minneapolis. It's absolutely amazing. This place is for children and teens in a youth summer program. They learn about planting, weeding, I almost put that together before I said plant weed. And I was like, oh my God, I can put a comma in there. <laughs> so I always did. I was plants. I was corrected on that one. They weed and they, have, they do watering. They do composting. They preserve the harvest. They prepare the harvest. And they also take home from the garden the produce. And the beauty of this, that these young people produce what they produce and they don't take home. They donate it to local food shelves across the city. And they produce vegetables, herbs, fruit, and flowers. If you have a chance to see this place, it is magical. Um, I have big visions for this one, which I don't want to put out there because I don't want to jinx it, but it's, I, I have a whole idea we want to do in this place and actually make it a really an incredible place of learning and growing. So imagine an actual structure here, like an education place, but we'll talk about that later. So really wonderful. So I wanted to share that one. It's a wonderful spot. All right, major projects, right? This is really exciting stuff. These are the big shiny object stuff, right? So we start with kind of the smaller things that are so important in our park system. But let's talk about some of these wonderful projects that we do, the capital that we build and what we do to impact the lives of our, of our residents. So major project along the riverfront, all right? Waterworks. How, how many people know about, who, who's gotten into the restaurant there? Raise your hand. Restaurant, right? Okay, I thought it was more difficult than that. All right, all right that's good. No, but it's hard, it was hard to get into. Waterworks is amazing. Sean Sherman, right? Um, and Dana, to get the James Beard Award, the best chef in the country, Julia Childs Award. The awards for architecture in a park building, right? It's just crazy. Um, when I tell my, my friends across the country, I brag, and I go, so what did you guys develop today? Right? And they go, oh, we did a new skate park. We built a building with the James Beard Award restaurant, right? <laughs> you know, and they start laughing, and I go, okay, whatever. So uh, it opened in 2021 on the downtown riverfront. It's a two-story building, a Wamini, of course, in there. And then other, you can, there's a, to the left there, there's a, a place you can rent out, and it's a beautiful place. It has playgrounds, a terrace steps, plaza, and fire pit. I have an incredible gratitude to the Parks Foundation for this one. This is the Parks Foundation, what they did to bring this to where it is today. Man, the Parks Foundation. And all the donors and people that contributed to this has just been absolutely amazing. Uh, this is the wonderful work that the partnership of the Foundation and Park Board do. And this is just one example of it. And what a magnificent, magnificent example it is, what we can do together. So congratulations, yeah. But I'm not done yet. <laughs> you got more. We got another major project, of course, the 26 Overlook. Gratitude to the Parks Foundation again. And we broke around on these. We cut the rib and stood there together in these wonderful places. Um, what a beautiful place. What a wonderful, wonderful place. 
It connects the 26th Avenue bikeway all the way from Theodore Worth all the way to the river. We talked about what happened on the north side in the 94 cut the, uh, cut the city and cut north side off from the river. The riverfront, I cut them off, right? This place, when we built it, I kept telling people, I said, oh, that's just the beginning. Now we're building a connection from 26th that'll travel on the river and go by Ole Wilson Park. And now imagine the north side and folks riding their bikes on 26th from Farview or Theater Worth. They hit the, uh, this overlook. They go down that pathway. All of a sudden, they discover Ole Olson, and now they go past the Parkport headquarters, and they keep grinding the line. Now they're at Waterworks, and they keep going. They're going through Longfellow. They get all the way to Minnehaha Falls. Like, it's mind-boggling. So talk about connectivity for our, for our community. This is, this is what the Park Board does, and this is important for our equity and for really bridging the gap in our community for people who have been disenfranchised and, dis and not connected. This is the beginning of this, so we're very excited about that. Um, and again, thank you to uh, the, found the Parks Foundation. It was brilliant. Juxtaposition did a great work there too. So, um, but we acquire, we build, and we connect. Right. Another one, Halls Island. People laughed at us. It's like oh, Halls Island. Things like you know, it was taken over by 1960s by lumberyard. Right. We restored this in 2018. And guess what's happening over there? Great wildlife. Right. Natural habitat on that piece of land right there. It's pretty amazing. And for us to see that and to think about that and to create this space was really brilliant. And of course, we struck a deal with Graco in 2018 to build Graco Park right outside there. If you have a chance to see the 3D rendering, it's just stunning. It's the first new net zero energy building um, in 2018 to build at Graco Park. And it's going to connect Boom Island under Boom Island. It'll connect under the Plymouth Bridge. So it's going to be a wonderful place for you to come to and experience. And it's, it's a beautiful place. If you have a chance to see it, please take a look at it. It's really amazing. Another one, of course, that's so important, <clears throat> a major project in the riverfront, the Upper Harbor Terminal, which is really exciting. It's a 50-acre site that's going to be built along our, our park. We worked with the city and the developer. It's a 20-acre park that we just acquired. It's going to break ground next year. And it's starting off as not just green enough, but lots of stormwater gardens, trails, entry plaza spaces, and we listen to community and we are building out more in the future. I can't thank the NWMO enough for what they're gonna be doing in this water mitigation of this area, the ecology, it's gonna be absolutely amazing. So we're very excited about that. And the runoff is gonna be now a regional stormwater location for our parks, so we're very excited about that. So again, another wonderful project that we're doing within our park system. Let's talk about some other major projects on the riverfront, of course the Kronig Nature Center and the city exhibit uh, in 2021. They did a brand new exhibit at Kronig and it's a nature style playground and it's a center that is really a great place to interpret, to see the wonderful things that are happening along the river. And if you have a chance to even go along the outside, we have a natural playground. You can run along the playground. It's a natural playground system. It's really wonderful. So another thing that we have now brought forward to interpret our area in the riverfront and we're very, very pleased with that. And of course, another project, North Commons, the big one that we're doing. And of course, gratitude again to the Parks Foundation, the work they're doing in helping us to get to this project. This is the largest inve investment in neighborhood parks in our history that's gonna be at North Commons Park. It's a $35 million project that's gonna impact and transform the lives of our community in North Commons. And so we're so excited about that, yeah. The board just approved this in October, thank you. The board approved this plan. It's a 58,000 square foot building. It's gonna be transformative, not only economically and what it's gonna to mean to the community, but it's also gonna be a place where young people don't have to look outside their community and look at a wonderful recreation center in the suburbs. They're gonna look within their own community and say, this is a place for us. And we don't have to look outside of our community and think, why don't we have that? We're gonna have it now in our community in 2027. We're very proud of that. And we're gonna be working with community uh, on projects, I know the Parks Foundation is doing some wonderful job and investing also in programming and, and uh, other groups that they can come in there and program out that space. So very, very proud of that place. It's gonna have three gyms, not including our one that we're gonna currently have in there, but three new gyms and a fitness center, dedicated spaces for teens and seniors. And we're gonna rebuild the water park, but it's gonna be a community event center. It's gonna be a place where people can have celebrations, not just sports. And of course, this one I'm very excited about, uh, our Spark Studios. 
this is a really major capital project. What I will say, I can go on this for hours. This is a creative hub for youth. It's illuminate careers and creative industries. What I can say about these spaces, we're gonna build six of them. We've built three so far. We're completely transforming the interior of a building to these new spaces. And the imagination of young people when they come in there and they walk in the door, they have something they can do immediately when they hit the door. Everything from design, graphic work, to architecture, to being an entrepreneur, STEAM programs, audio engineering, documentary work, anything their mind wants to go to, we can create in this particular space. Technology is the resource, right? That's all it is. What we're trying to do here is transform the lives of young people and their imaginations. So we opened up at Pothorn. We just did Harrison. We just dedicated Whittier. The next one's gonna be Luxton Park. After that, we're gonna do Phillips Community Center. And then Graco Park will be the sixth one. That'll be for our young people. And they've already talked about doing boat building as an example out there. Can you imagine that? Building a boat. So pretty exciting. But this is limitless to what they can do in these spaces. And we're completely transforming these, these, these spaces with the latest and best technology. It's not just good enough. It's excellence for our young people. And of course, Bede Makoska, huge pavilion that we built there. It opened in 2020, of course, just recently. Pimento on the lake. Uh, Tommy, who owns Pimento. And to see just him in there with his, with his family and, and all the people there. Pimento Market that's open year round. It's a, you know, it was, it was a historic site, the building that burned down. We're sad about that. But look what we've now been able to create, right? It's a place that's now more accessible. It's open to more people. And it's open year round. So you look at the design itself, you have more access to the water. And just to think about this particular place on our lake that you can sit on the, on the waterfront and enjoy amazing food, Jamaican food, right? By, and, and a market that supports 28, I think 28 BIPOC businesses in the market. You know, it's just amazing. So we're very, very proud of that also. Yeah, it's great. And of course, we can't forget about MPP 20. Our neighborhood parks wouldn't be where they are today without this. They were in bad shape. So in 2016, uh, with the deal with the city, we finally acquired the funding to fix them up over the next 20 years. Dozens of projects are happening year round. Playgrounds, I mentioned earlier, courts, skate parks. We're also rehabbing HVAC systems through our parks and repairing roofs. Um, and all of this is dedicated by what they call community, char community characteristics plus park characteristics, which then gives us the metrics to we call neighborhood park and rehabilitation and capital projects selections through our park system. We're the first in the country to do this, and we're incredibly proud of that. And now every park system that is doing this is now copying Minneapolis Park and Recreation. We led in this, we were the first to do it, and it's amazing. It doesn't be, it's not determined by what I think and what I like out there. We should do this playground. It's determined by these metrics that determines what is necessary and what we have to do first. And that's really exciting. So again, MPP 20 has been absolutely amazing to have, and you can see the projects continuing to happen every day. Yeah, another one. Data and mapping. This is the thing that I'm really committed to when I came into this organization. I really want to look at data. I wanted to have data drive our decision making to make informed decisions. It's an organization-wide emphasis on data and mapping. And, it's the, and I created also at this time when I came in, it called the Data Insights Team. I took our analysts across the organization, put them under one roof underneath uh, Adam Arvidsson, who's our Director of Strategic Planning. And this team does incredible work around our police data, around our recreation data around all the things we do in our system. And some of the mapping that you see up here uh, is what we have called 10 interactive maps. We have beach water quality maps. We have ice rink maps. We have wading pools, plowing, mow tracking, snow plows, and trash truck tracking. That's hard to say really quickly. Uh, but we can tell you which garbage can is empty, which is full, and we can track all these now. And we can tell you what places we've plowed, uh, what places we've cleared on skating rinks, it goes across our system. Data is important. It tells us not only the qualitative, but quantitative, the work that we need to do. So very excited about that. And we also revamped our active net, which is more friendly user on the, uh, on the user side. And of course, climate resiliency, very, very important. And we do tree plantings with Green Minneapolis. I'm not sure if you all know about Green, Mass, Green Minneapolis work, but it's a private public where MPRB plants and maintains trees with Green Minneapolis that certifies the planting as carbon offset projects with the city's forestry credits. The car carbon credits are sold and then they return 80% of those proceeds to MPRB. The reason why this is so important is that it gives us an opportunity 
to continue to keep planting our trees, right? So we know that the money will always be there, but carbon offset credits are really, really important for the organization, and we're grateful for Green Minneapolis. And they sell those credits. Some of them that they sold was like the Winslow Capital, Excel Energy, but they also sold to the American Society of Landscape Architects, who did an offset carbon emissions when they came over to the conference in this past October. So very, very excited about this work. And again, it's innovative in thinking about our canopy and our forest. All right. Can you all see the signs? Can you see it okay still? Okay, thank you. We also have climate resiliency to talk about more about innovative. We have solar panels, we have solar panels across our organization. We have some at Parade Stadium, East Phillips, Lake Nokomis, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. site, and Weber Natural Pool as examples of our solar panels that we have across our park system. Again, looking at ways that we can uh, reduce our emission. Pa this uh, parade has the largest solar array in our parks on top of the roof, and they, do, uh, they help power our, our ice rink. And we also have many renewable energy projects through our park system. We also are electrifying our, feet, our fleet. Uh, this one is a charging station over at Southside Service Center. Not only are we electrifying our fleet, we're electrifying our maintenance and our equipment. Everything from blowers and from uh, mowers, all of it we're working towards that. And we're doing charging stations across our organization also that you can plug your car in and we're moving towards really efficient electric vehicles and also electric uh, equipment. So again, another innovative climate resiliency that we're working, working through. And this one really excites me, Teen Teen Works. We're gonna talk about youth employment and green jobs, which talks about climate resiliency. Um, we need workers for this effort. So we've put into place really training the next generation of green jobs. Um, and we are working with our Minneapolis park crew. They're called the park crew, recreation center internships, maintenance internships, and power crews. So we have multiple crews that are doing some great work out there in our organization. And this is really a training initiative that focuses on recruiting, hiring, and training youth, is, youth ages 14 and 24 in underrepresented and underserved communities who live in Minneapolis. We are the largest employer of youth in the city. And this is just one way that we connect our young people to what we call green jobs. We are incredibly grateful to Senator, Senator Fata, Fateh and Representative Hassan, who now invested $750,000 for two years. So $750,000 in one year, $750,000, so $1.5 million that's being given to our youth and our programs. And this money will now not only give them more hours, but more money they put in their pockets, so higher wages, and the work that they're gonna be doing across our park system. We really put our efforts into Cedar Riverside also, and we had 30 new youth from the Somali community that really were working with us in our recreation centers or out in our, our, our parks this last year. So very excited about that and grateful for the work that these teen teen works do. This is an example of one of the power crews that were out there and they're really proud because they get to hire, uh, handle power tools. So it's pretty cool. I actually watched a young man with an auger and was putting a stump along Theater Worth and he built a fence. And I was standing there watching him and he was just smiling at me while he was putting the auger in there, you know? And it was absolutely amazing to see this young man uh, doing this incredible work out there and teaching him a tool. And we're stair-stepping these young people that they can start finding jobs in green jobs and green infrastructure. That's what we do in the park system, right? It's not just picking up trash, education. Yeah. Yeah. And this is another great one here. This is them pulling buckthorn at Worth. So uh, this is just one of the many things that they do. But they learn about buckthorn. They learn about a biodiversity. They learn about the natural environment through work. And they're absolutely amazing, amazing young kids. Um, we've done well over 250. I think last year, probably more than that. And we're going to continue to do more. And again, Minneapolis Park and Recreation is the largest, largest employer of youth in the city of Minneapolis. It's really incredible. All right, keep rolling. All right, uh, next thing we have here is um, the youth design team. Another great uh, example here. This one, they were actually staying outside of Waterworks um, and they were doing a construction site analysis. And these are young people doing this work. So proud of them. They also did a tremendous amount of work through our comp plan, youth design team. And they played a really important role in all the Parks for All process. We're very proud of them. 12 youth working with the four, four areas, career development, 
uh, connection to community, youth education, and intergenerational engagement opportunities and workforce development. These young people did this work and they're brilliant and this might open up the doors of imagination to go into planning or design or whatever they want to do, but we do these youth design teams every year. I see them sitting down in the planning room. They did this really good stop animation thing for the comp, comp if you've ever seen it before, it's like a stop animation and it's, it's just beautiful and you can hear their voices narrating over it. They're just a great group of young people. We're very proud of them, so great work for them. Let's talk quickly about recreation, and we'll go through this. It's gonna be kind of the, sort of the end of this. Um, when I came to the recreation, when I came to the park board, I talked about six pillars of recreation programming. And when I said pillars, what I meant to say very clearly was foundationally that we do things that are established in our work, right? Pillars are only there, you dig the hole and you create this foundation. And that's why we call the pillars. And around the pillars, we talked about Spark Studios, which I just talked about, I could talk about that for hours. Community-focused youth employment, which we just shared, right? Nature programs, which we shared. Cycling, everything cycling. Everything cycling should come to our rec centers. We actually just purchased two trishaws. And if you ever heard of thing called cycling without age? Has anybody ever heard of cycling without age? So imagine an uh, electrified bike, two wheels in the front, one in the back, you sit in the back, and you steer from this kind of handle. Two people sit in the front, right? And then they're kind of, you can ride with folks around the parks and trails. When I did it in Mecklenburg, I remember um, going to a place, um, it was an assisted living, and this um, woman, she had, uh, she had dementia. And her worker was working with her and said, we bought our tri shawls there, right? They cycle without age things. We went there and I picked her up and she and her, her and her care provider got into the view, got into the tri shawl and we were riding along the trails and this woman who hadn't spoke or said words in months started singing, which is crazy. But this is what we're going to do, right? So, <clears throat> okay, recreation, adaptive programs. Sorry, I always get emotional because it was an emotional moment. Uh, adaptive recreation. Um, we're talking about, uh, you know, adaptive op obstacle courses, and this is at Matthews Park that they had this. Uh, we talk about exclusivity in everything that we do, right? We talk about parks are for everyone, accessible to everybody. We have adaptive programs and dedicated staff to work with people with disabilities. We have a therapeutic recreation and inclusion uh, leads and, and specialists that work with our young people. You can call and you can ask for assistance and help and we respond and we're out there with our, with our, with our community. Um, and it's really amazing and they do great work. And the last thing, I'm just go back to this try shot thing to say we have two of them and we're gonna be riding around our neighborhood and we're gonna be inviting people to get in and get our, our folks that are maybe homebound, that uh, need assistance, uh, that just want to be able to smell the air and, and you know, take a deep breath, feel the sun on their face, right? To experience nature. What she experienced was an emotion which brought her back, right? Because she was outside. That's the beauty of it. So we're bringing that to our parks. And so sorry, I wanted just to finish with that. But our adaptive is very important too because the same thing, right? We can use these two to get our, our people into these, these bikes and ride around with them and have them have experience out in community. Go get an ice cream or a burger or whatever. So we're very excited. And then this one, um, balloon arms in the back room. Uh, this is our theater camp that we had done before. Just wonderful kids and wonderful young people that do some wonderful, wonderful things. We've waived youth registration fees in any park in areas of concentrated poverty, ACP and ACP 50. 17 parks that have no fees at all. And every park in our system, if any child comes into any of our parks, there is not a fee that we, we don't turn anyone away. We have fee assistance, we have scholarships. No one is turned away, nobody. Any child that comes in our park can go for free. Yeah, we made it very clear in those 17 park areas though because we wanted to make sure that we look at census data and ACP and AC50, we wanted to focus on those and say, there's no questions asked in those areas. So we're very, very proud of that. And uh, we have the money and the availability for any child to experience a park. I love this picture. Uh, do, do, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, this was really amazing. But stand up paddleboard yoga at Nokomis Park, or Nokomis Lake, which is really cool. And it really talks about what we call a niche, a niche program of every interest. This is just one example, right? Um, you know, and, and what a great way again to experience these wonderful lakes that are ours, that we have access to. 
There's not a million dollar house butted up against it and you can't walk across it, right? We can walk along our lakes, we can go up to our lakes. Um, I will never do ice dipping where the thing is they, <laughs> maybe I will, I don't know probably, but uh, yeah, it's a uh, polar plunge. Oh God, that's why I'm committed to that. Yeah, <laughs> polar plunge, yeah. But um, there's all sorts of amazing things that are done in our park system from ice fishing and uh, it's pretty exciting. And then we also have, again, this one really fascinates me. The Potterhorn, uh, this is called the Potterhorn, well, this is the Potterhorn family puzzle, uh, and it's folks that are just doing puzzling games, right? So simple, but people coming out to our rec centers and doing puzzles. And if you look at the generational folks that are in that room, it's really cool. And remember one of the pillars I talked about, intergenerational? That's it, it's not about isolation, right? Those trishaws, it's about having a young person sitting with their, with their grandparent or someone older and riding along, right? It's about having these spaces that just do fun programs. And Puzzle is a simple thing, but a great example of the work that we do in our communities. I think this one's at Potterhorn, if I remember, because I can see the, uh, I worked there for six years, so it looks like the place I was there. And this one is really cool. I've never heard about this. Bike polo, has anybody ever heard of that before? <laughs> yeah, bike polo at Central Gym. Um, you know, I think this is something that I'd probably want to try because you can look at the legs on these guys. That's, that's good. You come about <laughs> getting incredible shape, right? Uh, this is something, again, one of those niche programs that we do in our park system, and they're pretty amazing. And we love the fact that they said, hey, we want to do bike polo. Well, let's do bike polo. Another thing that's really cool, a niche program, our senior field trips. Our field trips we do across our park system. And look at the smiling faces of these uh, adults, these older adults in the building, or in the, in the, uh, in the vehicle. And I think they're going to a play or Chanhassen or somewhere a movie, but we do a lot of senior, I say older adults, but older adult programs through our park system. And in the back is Mitch Waku. He's one of our staff. Uh, he loves the seniors, does great work with them, but they have a wonderful time and we get them out in our park system and we get them some wonderful events. Uh, so we're very, very proud of that. This is a really cool one too, Open Swim Club. Thousands of people that go on the lake and they swim across our lakes. I never knew about this really until I went out there and I saw this and I was like, okay, I gotta get in the, get in the lake. I'm not gonna wear a Speedo, but uh, I'll get in the lake uh, and swim. I think Commissioner Musich does this, doesn't she? And you do too, yeah. So we gotta get our commissioners out there to swim across the lake, right? But it's a great program. Another example of the work that we do in our park system and, and what it means to the people and the variety of things that we can do and that we provide within Minneapolis Park and Recreation. So we come to the end, uh, a little bit of conclusion of this. And I could have talked for literally hours on some of these subjects, but I really appreciate your time and, and talking. This is a taxpayer, taxpayers built this park system. You all built this park system. And we are grateful and thank you for the support that you give to this park system every day and what it means to the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. It is unique, if you take the top five uh, 100 top five parks in the country. Minneapolis ranks in the top five and the most giving residents in all of the 100 parks. We've ranked in the top five in the last 10 years. We've been number one for seven years. TPL is another story, we'll talk about that, but yeah, <laughs> top five. Yeah, so we're so proud. And, and TPL is, is data driven, right? And, and so there's metrics in there that are about, it's not about uh, your potholes and your, it's not about that, right? So we're very, very proud of that. Parks, parks have been literally the fundamental park of our city's prosperity. Um, you know, we, we are not done though. Um, we wanna continue to make it better. We wanna continue to look forward. We wanna continue to innovate and create the best park system in the country. We're asking you to join us to help to continue to improve our park system and what it means to us and impacts the lives and health and wellness of all of us and what it means to who we are. Our vision is comprehensive. Uh, we're forward thinking and we are universally inclusive in the work that we do. So you can help, of course, right? You can volunteer, you can donate, you can advocate, you can get involved and you can give feedback. It's very important. You can also join us in continuing to improve our system. You can send us information, ask us questions, and let us know what we can do to be better. And we will listen and we will adapt and we will grow with you, because this is your park system. I'm a public servant to you all. The board is elected by the people. 
The people are the ones that own this beautiful jewel of a park system. Yeah. And this is an example of these folks here that were um, d uh, picking up trash at Boom Island on Earth Day, right? Uh, Earth Day cleanup. So you can help, right? You can be out there, you can volunteer. And if you want to volunteer, please call or a link to our site, MinneapolisParks.org backslash volunteer. Um, human capital, people. That's what makes us work and makes, it helps us survive. This is what makes us thriving is the volunteers. It really is. Without our volunteers, without our advocates, without our donors, we wouldn't be where we are today. And so the prosperity of this park system is by you all. Uh, this one is Washburn, uh, tot lock, tot lot where they're planting, right? Parents and adults are out there helping these young people and learning and growing together. So of course, donate your time, donate your resources. The system was built on the generosity of your support. I can't say that enough. So please advocate for our park system. Help us spread the word about the good things that we're doing, right? And we need your support. We need you to know about us and who we are. The biggest thing that I find a lot of times when I talk to people, we've been around 140 years and people still don't fully know what the park system is and what we do and what we provide. It's so comprehensive. It's so complex, but it is a beautiful park system by you all and by you uh, loving this park system so much. So in conclusion, the last thing I'll say is get involved in our park system, give us feedback. And this is your park system. I work for you and I'm asking you to join us and help us to improve it. Thank you for your time, I really appreciate it. Yeah. So how did yeah. you get involved in parks? Oh, long story. Well, short story. Um, so I grew up in the park system in Milwaukee, um, in, in Wisconsin. And I tell a story which is true. Uh, I used to ride my bike from the east side. I had a beat up bike that my dad gave to me. And it was a classic bike, single speed. I think I was about 10, maybe 10 years old. And I would ride my bike from the east side all the way down to the Art Institute off of Lake Michigan. And I remember going through parks and riding along the parkways, and, and I was this, uh, this African-American, this black child, sitting in this art institute drawing, overlooking Lake Michigan. And in the background, they were playing music, classical music, and just a variety of like, songs I never heard before. And my dad is from Republic of Guinea, West Africa, so I was gr grew up with very diverse music. But there I sat, and it was a park program that got me started and saved my life. And I remember sitting up there and having this experience, and then I went to McKinley Park in Lake Park, and I learned to play tennis there, a public court, right? So here's my brother and I with our big afros and our headbands around there, and we had beat up <laughs> tennis shoes, and, and I learned to play tennis at a public court. My brother and I grew up playing tennis. My dad was self-taught, and uh, he always embarrassed us because he wore these really short shorts and <laughs> dre dress socks, and it was horrible. But my dad taught us to play tennis, and my brother and I became one of the top tennis players in, in, in the Midwest. We were number one doubles team. We were uh, just, we really loved tennis, but that was all of our starts that we got in a park. Uh, when I started working uh, in my professional life, went to school at the University of St. Thomas, and I worked for Target Corporation. I was a grants administrator and I'd wait coordinator, right? So I got this executive position and I thought, oh God, I made it. I was on the eighth floor, you know, and, and working there. And one day I just said, I have to do something different. I just have to change my life because I was pushing paper all day and, and embarrassing to say it's my wife who started working there also. I was dating her at the time. I was so exhausted from pushing like grants and things. I almost fell asleep at my desk and she caught me. <laughs> and she said, she goes, what are you doing? You know, you can't, you know? And I was like, okay, I gotta change my life. I do something different. So I did, I, I quit that job and I thought it was the pinnacle, you know, I'm working as an executive. And I quit that job and I went to this uh, one month executive session where they tell you who you are, right? And they said, Al, you're in the wrong profession. You need to be working with people. And so I went back and I looked and I saw a job open at Park and Recreation, where, you know, and I was like, oh, I grew up in parks. I can do this, you know? So I applied. Uh, I luckily scored number one on the exam, or else they wouldn't have looked at me. <laughs> um, and, I, and I got my first job at Weber Park. And that's what brought me full circle, is I said I need to change my life and do something that I'm passionate about and I love. And I knew that I could make a change in the lives of people. And I, I, this is honest to God truth. The first day 
I went to Weber Park. I remember I was working at Target. It was 85 degrees out. I was wearing a suit, and I was carrying a briefcase. <laughs> now, if anybody you know parks at Weber Park, I walked into that place. I was sweating. And the guy behind the desk goes, your office is back there. And I was like, okay. I sat down. Next day, I was wearing shorts and a T-shirt. <laughs> and I got to work. And I got to work. And uh, it really changed my life. And uh, when I was working at the hotels, when I was paying my way through school, I worked at hotels. My boss at that time said to me, who is the most important person in this multi-food store, the Marriott, is you. And I said, I'm just a, a doorman. I had that pith helmet with the feather in front. They changed that. Um, and he said, because you're the first person that they meet when they come into the, the, the hotel, you're the first person. And I brought that with me to the rec center. And I said, the people, these young kids, when they walk into our rec center, they're seeing you for the first time. And, and they're saying, and they go, hey, what are you doing today? The kid says, nothing. Well, come do it with me. Right? So that's, that's how it was for me because I understood the impact of my life and uh, the importance of what we do and, and bring young people into our buildings and our community. Long story, right? <laughs> no, it was a great story. I loved it. I loved the idea of you falling asleep on some oh, paperwork and your wife saying, <laughs> get it together. Yeah, yeah. Us. What All are you right. doing? So we got some questions from the audience. Sure. Um, how will your green space transform to prioritize biodiversity and climate resiliency? How will the green space? Uh, yeah, the green space of the city. Well, what's important, I know, it's is that... 50 degrees out today. That's yeah. weird. Well, we understand our tree canopy, obviously. It's very important. Uh, the work that we do around our trees and planting our trees continue to, to uh, look at our canopy. And we obviously know in a lot of areas within our city, uh, we have these heat islands that exist that are real, right? And so a lot of the uh, canopy that we build and that we keep planting is going to be very important to continue uh, that effort. Uh, part of the Green Minneapolis that I mentioned earlier is important because that is a way that we continue to plant uh, two trees for one, right? Very, very important. A lot of the environmental work that we do, everything from pesticides that we have done, some incredible work around that to reduce pesticide use within our, within our, um, our park and recreation system uh, is, is very important. Uh, the education and training and working with community to understand uh, the importance of our biodiversity uh, to educate as much as we can. We have our water quality experts that look at constantly our water and testing our water to make sure that they're safe. And uh, so we, we're going to continue to do the work within our environmental stewardship area uh, with the brilliant staff that we have to keep improving our green spaces, look at water mitigation, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The NWMO that's working with us, in particular around even uh, Great Go Park, right? They're with us in there, and we're capturing water that's flowing from our from our streets, from catch before it flows into the Mississippi River, Upper Harbor Terminal, NWNO, right? Looking at a district regional catch area for all this water flowing in from North Minneapolis and passing through that, capturing that water again before it flows into the Mississippi, working on with the NWNO with the city on our creeks, um, you know, to make sure that we are paying attention to uh, all of the biodiversity that exists within our city. In fact, I'll give a simple example. In front of, in front of the, uh, where I live in the house, they planted a beautiful garden out there. It was literally dead. The staff came in there and planted this wonderful flower garden. And I kid you not, when I walk out there, the bees and the butterflies just in that garden, when you see that simple, simple garden, that's what we do. And we do it all over our park system. We do it around our buildings. We do it in front of our, uh, all of our businesses. We continue to keep planting. We continue to keep putting out these natural areas. They're so important, so just a lot of different work. And we have natural plant management things that we're putting out there, so that's also very important to us. Keep Nokomis clean, that's where I do my, I do the open water swim club. You got man. it, yeah. I love that. Yeah. All right, how do you reconcile the properties that are not in the Minneapolis tax, tax district? So they're talking about Meadowbrook, Theater Worth, and please discuss, and this, this little, please discuss the beautiful concept of a regional park district. So the question is, how do we deal you with work with? How do you work like Minneapolis parks? Yeah. You're dealing with yeah. um, boulevards and the parks, but also outside districts. And you know, you think about Minnehaha, yeah. you've got to be working with everybody along the watershed. Yeah, we we have. Well, I will be very honest. We have um, amazing staff who have uh, incredible, like you know, acumen around relationships. A lot of the places like Hopkins or St. Louis Park and all these other Golden Valley, you know, because we have Theater Worth that exists there. We work very closely with our uh, our partners 
and our other cities. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's not, Thank you. It's, it's interesting about Golden Valley, about Theater Worth, for example, that the permitting that we do there is really through Golden Valley. It's a strange kind of relationship because Golden Valley, the land that's really park board land is in Golden Valley. But we work very closely with the city mayor and with the parks department. Uh, we have a really good relationship with all of our partners, mayors and, and uh, uh, city council throughout all of our, our relationships. So we do a very good job of staying connected, talking about projects, working together on things that affect, uh, if there's downstream water coming into the park system. So we work with Edina, we work with all these places, but we work together with them to make sure that whatever's flowing into our parks, uh, whether it's stormwater, whatever it might be, uh, we have a really good relationship and connection with them to make sure that what's ever impacting Minneapolis and impacting our parks, that we're talking to our partners to make sure that none of that is, is uh, not being mitigated or we're not talking about the impact that it has to our park system. I'm not sure if I answered the question on that one well, but. <laughs> you did a great job. Right. And it, democracy is complicated, man. It is, All right. it is. Uh, yeah. Public golf courses use a ton of resources, land, yeah. water, isn't there a better way to help the public access this sport? It's overrated sport, in my humble opinion. This person wrote. That wasn't it's overrated? Me. Okay. Yeah, overrated. And gain more from this land, you know, maybe maybe the farm, maybe mm. have people use it for farming, maybe give it back to indigenous tribes. So many better ways than golf. So? That's a really, that's a big question, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. It might be a little more rhetorical. But. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we have. Golf is, is beloved by a lot of people that use it and recreate on those courses. Uh, and it was funny, for many years, the golf courses were actually not making a profit um, mm. until the pandemic. Mm. Uh, and the golf courses are doing very well right now. A lot of people are now coming back to golf courses or using those golf courses and they're recreating out there on our courses. Um, this has always been a debate, right? When we talk about uh, what better use of you know, our courses and why don't we have it maybe turn into a park. And a lot of those things are happening across the country when it's not feasible to then operate and run a golf course. Some of them go back to natural areas. Some are then taken over by other uh, companies that can do and run it differently, run it as an enterprise in a very different way. Uh, our golf courses though, I know that uh, as far as the work that we do around there and the work that we do to mitigate water and to do look at all the storm water, Columbia Golf is a prime example of the incredible work we've done there just to really capture water. Uh, working with the city of Minneapolis uh, has been a really big project. So um, it's, it's a tough question to answer because I think, again, if, if the suggestion is, is that golf courses turn into something different than their intended use at this point, that's a whole different debate that the board would have to look at. And, uh, but again, our golf courses are there. They're being used for what their purposes are. Uh, we just have to look at ways to reimagine and rethink sometimes golf courses and what they can provide. Uh, Hiawatha is a very uh, big example, of course, but, uh, but you know, it's, it's a really, it's, it's a good question. But again, I can't answer the fact that we can't just say golf courses are going away, right? <laughs> I'm I'm, I know I'm getting old because I saw the picture of the people golfing. I thought, maybe I should take up golf. Yeah. It looks good. All right. Yeah. Uh, one, what do you have against pickleball? But seriously. <laughs> um, and how mm. will the mm. Minneapolis Park Recreation Board elevate indigenous communities over the next 100 years? That's a really good question too. Uh, we're doing a tremendous amount of work around that. I'm very proud of the work we're doing, not only in our comprehensive plan and the work we're doing around acknowledgement of indigenous communities, uh, not only in, in art and acknowledgement and storytelling, uh, a lot of the things we do around our markets, um, we do, uh, you know, even as we look at even Bene Makoska and the pavilion, the artwork that's there, the acknowledgement that we give, the work that we now are doing comprehensively. Uh, Carrie de Aspen Wall is doing some really great work around acknowledgement and around the work we're doing around indigenous communities and working with our communities. So this is something that is built into the work that we're doing. It's built into our comprehensive plan. It's built in all the strategic work that we do. Uh, and it's very, very important that we acknowledge that we are on stolen land, uh, that uh, the impact that it's had to the community and what it means, we have to acknowledge it and, and be aware of uh, the work that we have in front of us. And it's going to take time because we have to do it right. We have to listen to the community. We have to listen to those voices. Um, St. Anthony and the St. Anthony Falls area, uh, the Dakota tribe, the four tribes, we're working with them right now to understand the importance of St. Anthony, right? 
Uh, when you look at Awamani, having, that, having Sean Sherman in there and the work they're doing that is non-colonial, right, food, right, and acknowledging uh, that space is so important. So we have multiple things we're working on that we want to, that's very important that we continue to acknowledge, continue to work with our indigenous brothers and sisters and work together to make sure that we're doing what's right for our community. And it could be simple as even farming or picking, picking like foraging and, 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 and you know, gardening and being able to go into nature and, and uh, have that space and time for our community to experience that is so important. Um, what's different about how kids use parks and what do we need to know about how it's different that they use parks than when, when you were a kid? Oh. You talked about, I mean, e-sports. Yeah, e e-sports. What? what? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, what else is different and how do you plan the parks, parks and recs yeah. to make sure that kids um, get engaged? Yeah, we have to meet kids where they're at, right? The reason we build, we're building Spark Studios, why it's so important, is because we recognize that if a child is sitting at home and they're on video games and they're playing video games mm -hmm. and they're at home but they're connected, right? They have friends across in different states across the world but they're connected but they're at home what I think is so important is that we recognize that young people and technology is just different. Yeah. Uh, we can't think about recreation only in the context of just sports or just, you know, we have to think differently about it. Those are all really important, very important. But to bring a young person, I'll, I'll give you a quick story. There was a woman who had a child that was, uh, uh, was in a wheelchair, disability. That particular child didn't want to really do anything athletically, didn't want to do like, you know, adaptive sports or basketball or whatever it might be. So she heard about an esports program in a local park. She signed her child up because her child played esports, but they had a team out of a park center. Hmm. She brought her child to that park center. That child then saw other kids playing in this room esports. Child goes in the wheelchair with, with these other young people playing the sport. They're competing. So he joins the team, he gets a t-shirt, it's now a sport, he's now in the sport. The mom's in the back of the room with other parents and she's crying because she said, this is the first time that I've been able to actually sit with my child in a sport, right? And sit with other parents and not feel isolated because my child has a unique and wants to do something different. It's a simple story but it's so important that we have to start to think about our young people and how diverse and how different they are in their interests. Some kids want to do documentary work. Some kids want to do uh, music production. They want to do TikTok. They want to do, you know, they want to do whatever it might be. So we create these spaces, these spark studios, where they can walk in and their imagination just changes at the moment they hit the door. They start to think about their world differently. Some will not go to college, but they will go to a two-year trade school, or they'll go and learn about computer science but we have to open the imagination for these young people to experience something different. And that's how we're changing recreation. And we also have to think about, um, you know, the green jobs we talked about, right? Changing these opportunities for young people to think about the green world and infrastructure. There's a huge opportunity there. We're working with young people as they restored the Godfrey House. We took young folks and we taught them how to do a trade. So the park board worked in Hennepin County. These young folks went over to the Godfrey House and they literally repaired that building through the park board working with Hennepin County. We paid them, they get to keep their tools, and they actually got union cards. This is what we did in the park system. That was different from even Teen Teamworks. And that was the young people, the group of young people who didn't have, they struggled with the social security because they couldn't find their social security card. We helped them expunge their, their record, right? But we gave them an opportunity to change their lives through recreation, through trades, and through jobs. That's the change and transformative thing that the park system needs to be, and we need to adapt and be different. We have 47 rec centers. They should be a hub of ingenuity and innovation and transform the lives of young people and our community, right? That's just the way we think about this going forward. I want to take that bolt building course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Final yeah. question. Yeah. Um, that We live in a complicated democracy. Yeah. There, are, there are some protesters here who are talking mm -hmm. about stop privatizing our trees. What oh, did you want yeah. to say about that? Um, People are experiencing, and it's, it's, it's complex, um, tree condemnation as far as, we, we, the, the park board's responsibility is uh, 
assessing trees that have emerald ash borer, right? And I won't get into all the details behind understand it, but by charter, by law, we're required that that is what we do, state, federal, um, city, that's what we do. That's the responsibility we have for the tree canopy and the spread of emerald ash borer. Uh, and regardless of what people feel, you know, everybody's opinions around it, what we understood and we saw the tax levy that came through the city and the impact of the north side, home prices and values went up, right? And so the taxes were being, property taxes were being hit hard on the north side. At the same time, as emerald ash moved through the city and got to the north side, now they're being impacted with an assessment on a tree that could be anywhere from $500 to $7,000, yes. right? Could be $10,000. It could be three trees at $5,000. That's real impact and pain that people are living every day that are trying just to get by, right? For some folks that look at their home as wealth creation and a place they buy and they go, I have a home. But now they're trying to struggle to figure out how they're gonna pay this. Now there's all the things and options. They have five years, 10 years, 20 years, right? They can defer to the sale of their home. They're 65 plus if they have things where they can uh, find relief. There's all these things that are put into place, but people didn't know that. They didn't understand all of it, right? They bought a home and they didn't realize that this tree someday could be infected, right? All of a sudden now, tree gets tagged, they're going, what's going on, right? Now tree gets cut down, the shade that tree provided for their home is gone now, their home is hotter, right? There's, they love that tree, but the tree's infected. The responsibility of the park board is to control that tree canopy and the spread of it, and we've done a really good job on this. So what, what the protests and people are experiencing in their own lives is those challenges they're facing and the impact that it has on them every day. My only thing that I would say for me what's important is I hear you and we care about you and we have to help, right? And we, we don't pay for private trees, we do public trees, right? So we did some really great work. Um, we worked together with the um, city of Minneapolis. We got $8 million going forward to help homeowners in paying for their trees, um, which is really significant. And that was a really big deal. We asked for 26 million, we got 26 million or 29? Yeah, but well, we got eight million, right? Then, um, and I'm gonna say this story for Tom because I think he needs, I, I have to give acknowledgement to this great man. Uh, we were talking about the Cargill Foundation and the Cargill Foundation, uh, Hua Pham, is that the right to say it? Hua, Hua Pham, came to us talking about North Commons, this really wonderful project. And we sat in the back of North Commons and we were talking about uh, North Commons. And then she asked the question, can you tell me about Emerald Ash Borer? Because she was out in the community trying to figure out what was going on. And so Tom and I looked at each other and we were like going, oh, okay, yeah, we can talk about this. This is the park board we can talk about, because we do. And her eyes lit up and she was like, okay, and she leaned in and said, how can we help, what can we do? So we started talking, we put a tremendous amount of work in. What I will proudly say is not only did we get $8 million going forward to help homeowners, but we also got $500,000 from the Car Margaret Cargill Foundation to support from all assessments that were pending from 22 and 23, we paid them off, 300 and some thousand dollars. The extra 100 and some thousand dollars now is gonna pay the gap between when the eight million kicks in, we're gonna fill that gap to pay any assessments for those trees also. The other $100,000 that we have now is gonna go retroactively to help homeowners that are levied, that are now being impacted so we're now gonna go back and then help those homeowners going back to help pay for theirs. So, and so what you see for folks that come in and what they believe is what they believe. It's their, it's, their, it's their world, it's what they believe. What I'm saying is we hear you, we understand the impact and the trauma. We as an organization, I am committed to doing everything I can to help people struggling and impacted by something that they had no control over but now they have to pay bills and they gotta put food on their table. So we should acknowledge that and help, period. Even if it's not anything we did, we need to help. And that's what we're doing as a park system. Great, thank you, Al. Al Ben-Gar. <laughs> okay.